just a reminder that the session is being recorded and all participants are automatically muted. Um, we will be taking questions live and towards the end of the event. Um, we'll read them out and summarize those questions that have similar themes and direct them to our expert. Um, questions can be submitted through the Q&A function that's located on the main Zoom menu bar. Um, just the reminder to be aware um, that if you want to submit your question anonymously, to click the tick box. So, the Transition Related Surgeries Seminar Series is an information event that is intended to provide access to information regarding gender affirming surgery for trans and gender diverse people as well as their loved ones and care providers in Ontario. These seminars will be about one hour long, and we hope to hold it every three months um, by the Transition Related Surgeries team at Women's College Hospital. The sessions will provide education on the pathways to surgery, um, as well as surgical techniques and outcomes. The goal of these series is to provide prospective patients, their support systems, and care providers um, with a deeper understanding of what to expect and how to prepare for their surgical journey at Women's College Hospital. Um, our hope is to maximize the effectiveness of surgical consultations by providing patients with an op opportunity to engage with the team here and to learn about the pathway, the eligibility requirements and uh, processes and timelines. We also hope to help patients identify areas they need to address in preparation for, for surgery, including post-operative support and care. So our team uh, for the top surgery is comprised of two plastic surgeons, Dr. John Semple, and Dr. Katie Armstrong, who is with us today. Our TRS patients are supported through their surgical journey by our NPs, Emory Potter and myself, Nahir Anasara. Uh, all the patient referrals are triaged by the nurse practitioners prior to booking the initial consultations with our surgeons. And uh, the nurse practitioners also provide pre and post-op care to patients. So to introduce our surgical expert today, Dr. Katie Armstrong, um, she's an award-winning teacher and expert in gender-affirming top surgeries. Uh, she completed her fellowship training with Dr. Hugh McLean at the McLean Clinic and performs over 250 top surgeries each year. In addition to this, she is the coordinator of medical ethics education at the University of Toronto's Plastic Surgery Residency Training Program. Uh, she trains medical students, residents, and fellows in top surgery through lectures, office-based, and technical experience. As a re researcher at uh, a Women's College Research Institute, she aligns her surgical and research interests to focus on gender-affirming surgeries. So without further ado, I'll switch it over to Dr. Armstrong. Thanks, Nahir. Um, so it's a bit funny to talk about um, gender affirming breast augmentations and gender affirming mastectomies within the same uh, discussion. And so I, it was very hard to try and put them together. So I'm just treating them completely separately. And so I will first start by talking about uh, breast augmentations. And then afterwards, for people who are trans female or non-binary, um, but seeking feminizing procedures. And then afterwards, completely, I will talk about um, mastectomy options for people who are looking um, who are trans male or non-binary looking for more masculinized chests. Okay, um, so breast augmentation. So when you come to do a consult with me, the things that I want to know about are your past medical history, your surgical history, what medications you're on, what allergies you might have, just a little bit about the gender journey and what some of the expectations of the surgery um, are and what your support system is like. The one thing that I 
am pretty strong about is the smoking um, thing. So I recommend that all my patients stop smoking one month before and one month after surgery. And that comes from the medical literature that shows us that nicotine and even cannabis, smoking cannabis has carbon monoxide and carcinogens in it. And those three things impact wound healing afterwards. And um, the optimal time for stopping it is at least one month before and at least one month after while you're healing. I say that edibles are okay for up to a week before. And then anesthesia usually likes people um, to be away from edibles by that point. Uh, there's always a physical exam, especially for the breast augmentations, because I need to size people for implants and size is um, you need to do in person. So you come in person to see me and I um, see uh, the quality of your skin. I check the thickness of the tissue in the area to see if possibly we could go under the muscle or over the muscle, depending on how, um, how much uh, skin overlying tissue there is. I look at if there is any overlying breast tissue. We look at the breast footprint and the breast foot, uh, breast width. And so something that's relevant to all patients is this concept of BMI. So uh, what are the BMI cutoffs? Um, so at Women's College, we actually don't have a BMI cutoff. Um, when there's a high BMI and possibly multiple comorbidities, it might be recommended that you have surgery elsewhere, but I would say that, um, you know, they're, they're really good at helping us get our patients surgery here. And so, you know, I've done surgeries on people for up to a BMI of 56 here. And at the McLean Clinic, because that it, I operate at the McLean Clinic um, as well. And so at the McLean Clinic in Mississauga, we actually do have a BMI cutoff of around 35-ish. And the reason for that cutoff is because it's an outpatient facility with no capacity to have people stay overnight. So if there was a complication that arose after surgery or during surgery where we wanted to monitor you for a bit longer, we don't have that luxury. Um, and so if I saw you at McLean's and I thought you should have surgery at Women's College, then I would just move you there. And all of my colleagues that operate at McLean's know the same deal exists for them. So there's a nice cross relationship that exists right now. And then a, another question we often get is like, what's the minimum age that um, we're operating on um, with the pre-approval paperwork? And so for breast augmentations, I believe the youngest person I've done is 18. Um, and then for top surgery mastectomies, the youngest person that I've operated on personally um, was 14, um, and there was one person. Uh, but So there's no true minimum age, but this is sort of um, something that comes up. And so Tanner stage is important because according to the OHIP guidelines about um, if someone is eligible for an OHIP covered breast augmentation, um, the, the OHIP guidelines state that that person should be a Tanner one or less. And so you can see based on the descriptions here that um, this person that I've shown is a Tanner one or less, you know, there's really um, no enlargement of the breast. There's no enlargement of the areola. There's no projection. And so this person has been on hormones for over a year and did not develop breasts um, despite the estrogen. And the other thing I point out here is the breast width. So this is what we would be measuring during the consult to see how wide the footprint of the breast is because this would determine what the size of the implant is. And so there's many different types of implants that are um, that have been on the market over time, but the main type of implant that everyone's using now is a smooth, round silicone implant. There used to be teardrop implants, but those are not available anymore because they had a textured surface, so not a smooth surface. And because they were textured, they were associated with a type of breast implant associated ALCL, which is a type of cancer. And so those types of implants have been pulled from the market a few years ago. And so now everything is smooth and round. And the two major companies, which I don't think there's any difference between them, I use both, are Allergan and Mentor. Those Both of those companies are available in Ontario. They are called... Uh, 
gumdrop uh, or gummy bear implants, the reason why people use that term is because even if you cut it in half, the implant would maintain its shape. It doesn't leak out. The silicone's not going anywhere. Older silicone implants, if you used to break it open, I'll show you a picture. They used to leak out, but that doesn't happen anymore. It's like a gummy bear texture. Saline implants are still available. These are like water implants, um, but hardly anyone uses these mostly because like number one, um, they don't feel as much like a real breast as the silicone ones. If you do get a rupture, it ruptures, like the water disperses, it's gone. And then you have an immediate thing that you have to fix. Um, and those are like the major reasons why people don't use them. And so this is an example of how, uh, as a plastic surgeon, we size people. So we look at the diameter of um, the implants. And so I would measure someone's chest and I would say, okay, your chest width is uh, around 11 centimeters or whatever it might be. And so therefore, you know, I would size them at 10.8, 11 centimeters. And so the implants I would choose if you follow it across, can you see my arrow? Yeah, okay, so if you follow 10.8 across, you can see that this fits you for a 240 cc implant. Um, and I always get the comment that everyone online wishes they went bigger. You know, I, I always counter that comment be, uh, with saying that everyone online didn't go bigger. So they really don't know exactly what they're wishing for because sometimes, uh, when you go bigger, it, it's not always better, and there's possibly more complications or issues with malposition or um, issues with uh, the skin and how it responds to the implants being there over time. And this is an example of um, what I like to show of, of someone who went like a little too big or a little too wide. So you can um, see uh, the person on the left, their implant doesn't go beyond their lateral rib cage. So the breast is exactly where you need it to be. If they had on a low V-neck t-shirt, they would have great cleavage. Um, and every, but it's their implants are not making them look wider or bigger in any sort of way. Whereas the person on the right, I would argue, um, and every plastic surgeon is different, I would say that maybe this implant was a little too big for them. And now their breast footprint is making their body look wider. And this is exactly what a lot of trans females specifically don't want. They don't want to be a wider or feel like a bigger person. Um, and so I would never put that wide of an implant on someone or, or have a very informed conversation about this. Um, and the other interesting thing is um, people always go, oh, bigger is better, but bigger is actually just uh, wider most of the time. Uh, sometimes the depth or the, the forward projection gain, we're talking it's like a millimeter or two millimeters, which is really imperceivable. And so if you really want to bump yourself up from a 300 implant to a 360 implant, you're really just settling for a wider implant, which might not suit your body as well. So it's just all the things to think about. Um, when we put implants in, we either put them subglandular, which means it's just under the natural breast tissue that might exist there, um, and as or we put them submuscular, which means that we put it underneath the pec muscle itself. There's advantages and disadvantages to each of these uh, and uh, methods, and so it's really a personal discussion that we would have uh, with the patient and myself. And so subglandular is nice because if you do have a lot of breast tissue uh, baseline, then the breast tissue and the implant move together and you don't have problems with animation. So as you get older, all breast tissue sags and the implant would move that with that so that it looks nat more natural over time. Whereas if you put it under the muscle, it tends to get stuck up under that muscle and then the breast tissue just sags over top of the implant, which stays high, um, which people often want to revise. Putting it submuscular is nice for people who are really, really thin, where we're worried about that like Pam Anderson look where you can see the implant almost through the skin, like you just know that there's just an implant there. Um, and so it avoids that look and gives you a little bit better coverage. 
to put it submuscular if you're someone that's really skinny. The where we how we get the implant in. Um, so the most common way that people do it now is through the inframammary fold. So the fold on the bottom of the breast. So it hides in the breast crease, that scar. Uh, that's the most popular way because it's shown to have a lower risk of infection when you're putting it through the fold as opposed to through um, around the periareolar, uh, which it used to be a different way that people would do it sometimes or transaxillary, which always has to go under the muscle. So if you put an implant in through the axilla, you always have to place it under the muscle. And typically people are using saline um, in order to put it through there. Some silicone, but you can only get such a such a size through there. And it always has to be submuscular. So, um, and I never do those types. Um, for costs, it's always important to know. So um, the OHIP funded breast augmentations, um, the only cost there is to the patient is for the funnel itself. A funnel is a way to no touch technique to get the breast implant into the breast pocket. And that cost is around $200. And then if you were to pay out of pocket, like say you didn't qualify for OHIP and you wanted to pay off a out of pocket, most people charge around $10,000. I always warn everyone though, like even if you had a breast augmentation covered under OHIP, your chance of having a revision surgery over your lifetime is near 100%. And a lot of people like to relate it to tires. So, you know, if you have a tire on your car over its lifetime, you're probably going to have to replace that tire. There's some like wear down or things change, you know, your overlying breast tissue and the relationship with the implant might change, like I talked about before. And so your chance of revision is nearing 100%. Um, and then there's a high chance of those revisions not being covered because they're often cosmetic in nature. So even if you just wanted implants out, but you didn't really medically need them out, like there wasn't an infection or something like that, usually that cost is around $5,500. Or if you wanted to lift the breast tissue that had fallen to sit up where the implant is, um, and, or to replace the implants, uh, then sometimes that's around uh, $15,000. Or if you just want to swap out implants for a different, you know, say there's a new model that's out 15 years from now and you want to swap them out because we've learned stuff about this old model and now no one wants to use the old model, then even that cost could be around $10,000. So I just like to warn people that over your lifetime, there's probably going to be a cost that comes up and it's probably going to be pretty significant. Post-perioperative expectations. So I tell people that, you know, pain is about a four or five out of 10 for day one to day three. I give antibiotics for the first five days after surgery. Um, it's okay to shower on post-op day two. Uh, you can get everything wet, even the chest, and then you just pat the area dry and, and then put the bra back on. No heavy lifting pushing, pulling for around four weeks. You can't drive for a week or two. And that's really related to more of a medical legal recommendation, because if you got into a car accident and uh, you had to defend yourself to your insurance agency to say, you know, I could have responded the way I would have even before I had surgery. You just want to make sure you're covered. Um, no underwires for six weeks. And that's because the cut has decreased sensation and you could have the underwire jabbing into the cut and you don't realize it. Uh, no soaking in a bath for, or a pool for about three weeks until the there's no scabs or crusts on the scar and it's completely healed. Your follow-ups are, I'll call the patient a day after surgery. They'll come see me two weeks after surgery, then a month after surgery, and then three to six months, and then as needed um, after surgery. And this is like a classic example of someone that I've operated on. Um, so you can see they had like no breast growth or minimal breast growth pre-surgery. And I think these implants are like 275 and, you know, it's not making them appear wider. Um, they still look very petite, but it looks appropriate and there's good volume there. Um, and she's very happy. And this is an example of how implants settle with time. So you can see this person initially they're more, I think they were, I don't know, say two weeks after surgery initially. And you see where her uh, scar is. It's like uh, lower um, or like more inferior to where the implants are sitting. And then at the three month mark, her implants have started to settle and they look more natural, less like little 
like bullets underneath the skin or something like that. Um, but that process I usually tell people takes about six months until the implants settle into place and look more natural. Complications of surgery. Uh, so small risk of an infection. If an infection happens in implants, it's often very uh, devastating. Sometimes you can treat it with just an antibiotic, it goes away, but in the worst case scenario, you can have to take out that implant, leave it for six months, wait for the infection to clear, and then put in a new implant six months later. Small risk of hematoma or a seroma. If that happens, sometimes you have to drain um, or perform another surgery to get rid of the blood um, in that area. A uh, capsular contracture is your body's natural response to having a foreign body inside of it. And so your body walls off the implant and it sort of forms this saran wrap around the implant to keep it safe. And this is what happens in total knees or happens in hips. Whenever you have a foreign body in your body, but in implants, for some people, one side might get tighter and look different than the other. And in those cases, if you had that type of capsular contracture, you might choose to have another operation in order to fix the look of it or to fix the feel of it. Sometimes they're a bit tender. Uh, asymmetry, so everybody's a little bit different between the two sides, um, that's normal. Um, and but there is always the possibility of there being a more significant asymmetry, although exceedingly unlikely. Unfavorable scar. So the scars heal over time. Usually it takes a year for a scar to heal and fade, but they are always there. And genetically, how you heal, um, you know, the most important factor is genetics. And some people have darker scars, some people have raised scars, some people have these nice thin scars that you hardly see. But again, that's very genetically determined. We don't have a lot of control over that. Implant malposition is when one implant sits a bit different than the other. So maybe one sits a little lower than the other. Sometimes that's related to the person's native fold, like where things started. Um, but it can happen that one implant uh, drops as opposed to the other. Implant rippling or show. Um, so, you know, having a very thin overlaying uh, tissue layer and being able to feel or see the implant through. through. Uh, an implant rupture, like I said, that was more of an older concern, and this is a picture of what an old implant rupture used to look like. Now they're the gummy bear technique, so they don't really rupture in the same sense. And then this breast implant associated ALCL or squamous cell carcinoma. So there are types of cancer that have been affiliated with implants. And even we always said that it was just the texture devices, but there has been a case of just smooth devices with ALCL, but this is one case in the entire world. Um, but it's still good to know because it's a little bit of an evolving field. And this is an example of someone that had a hematoma. So you can see their big bruise on the one side versus the other side. And this is in the, uh, the, on the picture on the right is an example of someone with a slightly hypertrophic scar. So it's red, it's a bit raised, um, and that can happen. And that's about the length of the scars. So like three centimeters or four centimeters on the inferior aspect of the breast. Okay, now I'm going to go over to mastectomies and masculinizing procedures. Um, so similarly, the pertinent things to know are past medical, past surgical, all of this is the same. And the smoking recommendation is exactly the same. So no smoking one month before, one month after, including cannabis and edibles and including vaping and edibles are okay for up to one week before. Um, and then the physical exam again is very much the same. It really depends on uh, the size of the breast and the skin quality. Um, post-op expectations. So it's the same day surgery. It takes an hour and a half. There's this virtual visit post-op day one, and then an in-person at a week, and then at four weeks, and then as needed. For the first week, if someone has nipple dressings, nipple grafts, then they can't shower they, because they can't get those grafts wet while they're healing in. But everybody else who doesn't have grafts um, is allowed to shower on post-op day two. Uh, four weeks with the binder, but it's okay to take breaks. It's not like the other binders that sometimes people wear. Um, it's supposed to be comfortable so that you could take a deep breath in and out and not be 
uh, uncomfortable, just shouldn't slip down all the time. Um, but some people's shoulders are just naturally predisposed to having it slip down, and then you just have to adjust it up more frequently. Uh, no heavy lifting, pushing, pulling similarly for four weeks, but you should be able to do a desk job, desk job after one week. You should be able to do heavy construction after six weeks. And that's a similar recommendation for the breast augmentation patients. Uh, Post-op pain, most people tell me is like a two out of 10 while they're sitting, and then maybe a five out of 10 when they're walking around. Uh, most people can get away with just Tylenol, and then they might take one or two oxycodons over the first few days after surgery. Uh, and so there's a whole bunch of different type of surgeries based on um, what the goals and expectations are of the patient and also um, what size chest we're beginning with. So this is, uh, these two patients are people who have had keyhole procedures. So a keyhole is a semicircular or half moon incision on the lower border of the areola. So you can see here where the tape is, there's a little half moon cut right there. And then similarly on the other side, the reason why these two bandages are on um, the sides is because the drain just came out. This person's post-op day five, so their drain came out. Um, and there's drains for about five days with this type of procedure, as well as with the peri areola. The other types of procedures do not have drains. Um, and then this is like one of my patients that posted on Instagram or whatever, but you can see when he's immediately post-off, again, it's a semicircular incision. You can see where the steri strip is. You can see he actually has the drain in right now. Um, and then this is his like long-term result. This is someone that got the periareolar because they had a larger chest. Um, so this is not someone that could get away with a keyhole because there's too much extra skin. And so you have to take out a little bit of the skin um, at the same time. Oops, sorry. Um, and uh, But it's nice because you can kind of get away with a lesser scar um, in someone with a slightly larger chest, like an AB. This is called a wedge, or some people call it a nipple sparing double incision. And so the reason why this person opted for this procedure is because they wanted to try to preserve nipple sensation. It's not guaranteed, um, but the nipple is kept intact. It's not like a double incision where it comes off and on. It's kept intact exactly where it is, and their nipple position was high enough that it was okay to keep it where it was. Oops, sorry. Um, that it was okay to keep it where it was. And so then we just take out the tissue on the lower border. Um, and so they end up with this long scar on the lower border, but the nipples are exactly where they were. So you can't resize the nipple or the areola with this type of procedure. And then these are your standard double incision mastectomies with nipple grafts. So both of these are nipple grafts. Um, so that means that they came off the body, they went back on the body, they were resized and put in the more masculine position. And so they don't have sensation afterwards. Um, they're more like ornaments where they look like nipples. And some people will say that they can get hard if they get cold or not, um, but this is not everybody. And this is another example. And you can see the person on the right, they lost some pigmentation because they had some darker nipple areolar complexes and they really go pink initially. And then he got a lot of the color back, um, but there's still spots where it's pink. And I always tell people at the one year mark, you could just tattoo in the rest of the brown if you wanted to, or you could leave it as is because a lot of people's nipples are this variegated color where there are different colors throughout. And a lot of people are doing these like no grafts now. And I do this even for people who are, have breast cancer and are cis female, but don't want to recon. Uh, this is a good option if they don't want to recon, but they just want like a flat aesthetic chest. Um, and it's also great for people who are in sort of androgynous and, but like don't want nipple grafts or me, um, you know, like this uh, kind of blank canvas look. This is called an inverted T. So this person wanted to maintain nipple sensation or at least try because it's never guaranteed because you're still moving things around. Um, and so we did an inverted T where you can see he has an extra cut right there, um, which is not there in the double incision, but these aren't grafts. These are like his nipples that have been 
origami up into a higher position um, and made a bit smaller as well. And um, he did, he got like 70% of his nipple sensation back. So he's really happy. And this was a more uh, femme chest for someone who is non-binary and again, wanted to try and preserve nipple sensation, um, but didn't want to look over masculinized. Um, and another, I didn't include a picture, but for other people, we're not looking for a completely flat chest. I do offer breast reductions as well. Um, and we can kind of go as small as people want to go. Like if they want to be an A or they want to be a C. That's another good option if people aren't 100% um, certain that they want to do um, a total mastectomy, but want to be more comfortable binding or doing um, whatever. This is like normal, all normal nipple grafts. So they look gross um, and that's just the way that they are. And it's kind of a four week process where I tell people they might be scabby, they might be crusty, they might smell, and then they might look different than each other. And then they just kind of figure themselves out. And underneath it's sort of like a snake, it sheds its skin. And then underneath is the healthy stuff that stays with you. This is a picture of someone that got an infection, which is exceedingly rare, like I said, um, but you can see this side of the chest is more red um, and it was fluctuant underneath, like uh, boggy. And so when we took off the steri strip and opened it a bit, pus came out and we started him on an antibiotic and it went away. Um, and this is like the only true infection I can really think of. These are examples of hematomas. Uh, so you can see this, it's not a secret when it happens. It's a real big bruise on one side of the chest. Um, and it's much more swollen on that side, like double the size of the other side. And in these cases, sometimes you can drain it, let it soften and then drain it with a small needle. Um, but sometimes you have to open up the side and then put a drain in, let it drain and then take out the drain a week later. Uh, but this is what it looks like. And that's it. I didn't time myself, but hopefully that was long enough. Great. Thank you, Katie. Um, so now we're just going to go through some questions that uh, some of the participants have. Uh, we're just going to summarize it and um, direct them to you. Okay, so the first question was, uh, do patients need to be on hormone therapy uh, for at least a year before referral for breast augmentation? I, th I believe my understanding is that um, the on the OHIP referral forms, which I don't complete, I'm not like allowed to or whatever, um, but from the family med doc review or the endocrinologist, uh, they have to be on hormone therapy for one year and then be a Tanner one before the family doc or the endocrinologist or whomever puts in the approval, like puts in the approval for request. And then once the person gets the request or gets the approval back for a breast augmentation, like, yes, you have been successfully approved for breast augmentation, then your family doctor or endocrinologist puts in the referral to see me. Hmm. So it's actually a bit longer than a year. <clears throat> okay. And the second part to that question was, uh, do you note any difference in terms of uh, surgical outcomes depending on how long? the patient has been on uh, hormone, ther hormone therapy before surgery? Yeah, I I don't personally. I mean, I guess if, um, you know, if you're going like the non-OHIP route and you actually like developed a pretty significant breast pocket and breast size, then uh, sometimes when the skin's not as tight, like it's relaxed because there's breast tissue there as well, um, then it might 
open up some different options for you, like with regards to having it just subglandular as opposed to submuscular or being able to fit in a bigger implant, like if that was a goal, um, because there's more room because it's not a tight uh, skin pocket. Great. Thank you for that. Um, but it's very unpredictable, I would say, because some people really develop like large breasts on estrogen. And then other people, like the ones I pictures I showed you that typically would um, qualify for an OHIP funded breast augmentation, they, they don't develop any breast tissue. So, and it's hard to know, like, when's that going to happen? Because some people I'll meet, they'll be like, oh, you know, I was flat, flat, flat. And then like three years into estrogen, um, that's when all of a sudden I started developing breast tissue. So I just find like everybody's journey is a little bit different. So mm -hmm. I would just say, do it when you're ready to do it. Don't wait for, because it will be different for everyone. Okay. Um, and what are the current wait times at Women's College Hospital? I think it's, it's really not that bad. Um, I think it's around, I want to say six months is like from receiving the, like whoever submitted a referral around six months ago, then now we're seeing patients from that timeline. Um, and then to book surgery, I know like right now it's March and I'm booking surgery in July. Okay. Oh, and sorry, the hormone question also um, was related to all breast surgeries. So all chest surgeries as well. Um, is there a difference? No. It doesn't really, like, I don't, some people used to say that testosterone makes a difference for your, like, results, or how easy the dissection is and things like that, and I really don't, I've done a lot of this, and I don't find there's a difference. Okay. Um, so if a patient is on um, hormone therapy, uh, do you recommend them stopping for two weeks before or after? No, we don't for top surgeries because the surgery is quite short. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's only uh, up to an hour and a half procedure for both either scenario. And so we don't have people stop it. Okay. Um, what are the options for revisions for mastectomies in terms of um, uh, funding? Um, so it depends on where the patient had the original surgery. So if it was OHIP covered, um, then sometimes there's better options for a revision also being covered, but it really depends. And it also depends what is required for the revision. If it's just liposuction, then it, you can't, like there's no way to get that covered uh, because the government won't pay for liposuction. Or recently I had a guy that I, I had to do fat grafting and liposuction on, had surgery somewhere else. And so I couldn't cover, like there was no, there's no code, there's nothing to put in there to get him covered for surgery. But then he was able to get it covered through his work insurance. So there is a lot more of that coming available to people, it seems, where uh, their work insurance or like their family's plan will cover portions of costs. Um, so even the contouring costs I've had, um, you know, like a parent works at green, like works and has insurance through Green Shield or Sun Life or um, certain corporations have really good plans for gender affirming care. Um, so that is becoming way more common. I've noticed even in the last year. And I think you kind of, you covered this um, during your, uh, your presentation, but is there a minimum age for mastectomy? A 14 is the youngest I've offered it on. It depends on a lot of things. Like there has to be really good social support for the person. Um, and it has to be like a long uh, understood goal of the person and, um, and like, like realistic expectations, like a whole bunch of things have to be in place. But like I said, like 14 is as young as I've done. Okay. And, um, what is that? Is there a different process for breast reduction if it's not gender affirming? Yeah, so even if it is gender affirming, I put all of those 
approvals through a different process. And I always warn people, I'm like, I'm not like, it's not going to say anything about your gender identity. And if you read my consult note, I write it a certain way that I know that you'll get like the approval for breast reduction. Because if you try and say this is for like back and neck pain and having oversized breasts, uh, and then you're also like, oh, and they have gender dysphoria and this would help that, then the ministry gets confused. It's just not worth it um, Mm -hmm. because you'll get too much back and forth. And so I keep it simple for them because I know that way we'll get it approved. And so even though I know and you know that it's for both, uh, it's easier if we do it the standard way. And the other reason I do that is because I wonder, like, sometimes I offer that for like 16 year olds who their parents aren't hundred percent on board about like a full top surgery. And so they'll get a breast reduction. And then I want there to be a mastectomy option for them in the future. And so if I'm billing it, like I'm, we're doing the mastectomy gender dysphoria route, then that I'm afraid that funding wouldn't be available for them if they wanted to pursue that in the future, if that makes sense. Yeah. Oh, it makes sense. Thank you. Um, and we're just coming down to our last question. Um, if there are any concerns if someone has an implant and there's a um, hormone, re- hormone therapy related growth spurt, uh, can that occur after the implant? Yeah, the implant doesn't imp- like because we're either under the breast or we're under the muscle. Mm-hmm. Um, so the implant won't impact um, the breast growth. Um, so you could still go on to develop breast tissue, even if you got the implant early and then you continued on estrogen for like whatever seven years and then at seven year mark you develop more breast tissue or your weight changes and you develop more breast tissue that can happen um is that a concern it's not a concern it's just um yeah it can happen but i i think like you're putting the implant where the natural breast tissue would be um and so everything should still work appropriately and look appropriate but it could always be reassessed Um, body changes over time, like even, um, for implants in general, like regardless of whether breast tissue comes or goes or does whatever, um, you know, skin quality changes, um, you know, weight changes. So a whole bunch of things change over time. Um, Um, if a patient is on the OHIP wait list and is waiting for surgery, are they able to pay out of pocket, so to say, to skip the line? Yeah, that's a it's a little tricky. Um, so I think once you get the approval, I don't think you can, I might be wrong. This is not a perfect answer, but I think once you get the approval, you can't choose to pay out of pocket um, Mm -hmm. for that procedure anymore. So, but then like, I guess if you wanted, you could like leave the province and go get it done somewhere else. That would, if you wanted to pay out of pocket and not um, wait, I suppose that would be one option. But once you have the approval, I don't think that you can choose to go back to self-pay. So the alternative would be if you have the OHIP approval to leave the province to have surgery out of pocket. Yeah, if you were like, I need this urgently, I -hmm. suppose. But once you get the OHIP approval, like I said, it's like, it's under a year to Mm -hmm. me, I think. Um, In your opinion, um, how involved are friends or family during the upper chest surgery process? or in your experience? I always tell people that um, they should be able to do everything themselves after surgery. Um, So, you know, you should be able to go to the washroom by yourself. You should be able to walk to the store and get like a small bag of milk by yourself. You know, you should be able to reach for a coffee cup. Like people are often worried that they're going to be like this. You're not going to be like that. You can reach above your head. You can scratch your head the day after surgery. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so it's not like you need people to do things for you. I, I mean, sometimes my patients will have like their family member help them with some of the dressings, but I would say you don't necessarily need that. Like for the nipple dressings, everything's accessible. It's like just right on your chest or, you know, someone might get their family member to help them with their binder. But technically, if you wanted to, you could lay the binder flat on your bed and then lay on it then wrap it around your chest like that. Like all of these things are, you can be self-sufficient. It's obviously good to have someone with you the mm-hmm. night of surgery for sure. Um, and we have ARC as well. Like if you felt like you were really, um, you know, didn't have a lot of support after surgery, people have stayed at ARC um, for like even seven days, which I don't know why they would want to stay for seven days. I would miss my bed. <laughs> But um, some people do do that, you know, if they're very anxious about the process or like just um, think that they would do better in that environment, then that's that's something that we can arrange here at Women's or at the McLean Clinic that we both facilities have access. And uh, like during the consultation and the referral process, if they wanted to bring their support people or the family members, are they able to incorporate them into the care plan? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I just got off a zoom with like a person and their partner and then their like stepmom and their mom was like, everyone was on zoom. (laughs) Like everyone was zooming. (laughs) Uh, That's, that's, that's awesome. (laughs) Um, There's a package, like we give everyone the package. I always point people to online resources because sometimes it's like good to hear from other patients. I find like past patients are really pretty good about like sharing knowledge. Excellent. Uh, I think we just have one more question. There was a couple coming in, but we have one last one. Um, Do folks meet with any of the um, endocrinologists or looking to, uh, sorry, hold on. I think we might. Well, I think that's that might be it. Just that last question is being answered already. Um, I see if- how common are hematomas after masculinizing top surgery. Drain or no drain, it doesn't impact your risk of a hematoma. Um, so that's the drain is sort of in, in inconsequential. And I would say it's probably like one in a hundred people might get a hematoma like the ones I showed. Um, so it's not that common, but it's our most common complication, I would say, just because there's not a lot of other stuff that can go wrong. Does anyone have any more questions or things that they wanted to ask Dr. Armstrong? Well, thank you so much, Katie. That was really, really informative and really helpful. Um, Hopefully, our participants were able to have some of their questions answered and um, we hope to continue to offer more of these seminar series in the upcoming months. Um, Is there anything that you wanted to add? No, that's great. Thank you everyone for attending. Thank you everyone.